So, uh, yes, very glad to be here, Navid Malavik, uh, background in the network and security. Uh, previously, I, I have been at VMware for a year now, really exciting to be here. And uh, in my previous work, I did some work with Atea. I worked at Cisco for eight years before joining VMware, and I worked as a systems engineer. So that's a background from technical, but now I'm working as uh, uh, sales, because I'm the bad guy now. So hopefully I will give you some overview, but also deep down on uh, some uh, notions of technology, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it, in terms of network virtualization. So there are three key challenges we see in this area, and that's why I actually joined this company, VMware, working with network virtualization, because I truly believe that what we are doing here is really handling some concrete, I want to be concrete, right, having a technical background, some concrete challenges. And one of them is around security, infrastructure security. I will go through that, I hopefully give you an overview, and if you have interest in drilling down to that, please come by our stand or contact us afterwards. Uh, speed to market, that's another one that is quite important. And this is something that we do really good at VMware with a, a product called vRealize Automation together with NSX. And I will go through the intersection between those and how it can help an organization. And also what's nice is that once we are moving or abstracting away the software from traditional specific made hardware to a software la layer, that gives us the ability to do cost predictability. So it's based on x86, right? So it's reducing the cost. It gives you more predictability. And it gives you a nice way of adding lots of features and build a data center purely on software with the R&D tied to software as well. So what we're doing basically is that we saw that the server hardware, uh, uh, if you go back a decade, more than a decade, one of the things we talked about was server virtualization. If I would sit in a room in 1997, 1998, 2000, if I would have talked about this, people would have said, well, you know, we have used our dedicated service from our vendor of choice. We don't think that's something that you will actually gain so benefit from, right? But then, fast forward to 2015, when I ask, I can ask this room, is there anybody that don't see the benefit of server virtualization? So I think that's obvious, right? We, we even laugh at it that, well, you do vMotion. You are basically move your workflows wherever you want. That's the idea with network virtualization. Because if you look into all the pieces that builds a service, meaning somebody wants to access an application, a web front or whatever type of that, that application consists of several tiers, right? If it's a standard application, enterprise application. And you want to put security on it, you want to, depending on what part of that is, you want to load balance, you want to build a network construct of layer two, layer three, you want to have VPN services for accessing those, you want to tie that to Active Directory, you want to have services like DNS, DHCP tied to that stuff and build your data center based on that. And that's why we think that the way we are handling IT right now, based on the challenges I, I outlined, security, right? It's not about that we don't see attacks. It's not about building perimeter anymore. The internal data center is exposed to attack. It's just about time on when it will come in. And when you actually did see the attack, FireEye, that is a vendor that has quite nice uh, set of people working from acquisition called Mandiant, they are looking into and, and seeing, for example, how long does an a, a enterprise how long time does it take for them to actually see an attack? And they have said that it takes around 200 days to actually see that you have been exposed to something. And the reason is this, right? The reason is that once somebody comes in, they can laterally move between the workloads. I will come back to that. 
And we think that by abstracting software to the layer, you can handle the challenges more quickly, like security. Or if you want to have a developer community that is running Docker or you know, moving to the cloud and you can't pace with it in their internal IT, here, is you have a, here you have a chance to build something that works for them instead of point provisioning all the different hardware stuff in the line of building a service and providing that. And that takes 18 months if you are a, a service provider. And that's based on my own experience working with Telia Sonora in the Nordics. And we don't have that time. So that's the idea. So when talking about networking, we talk about layer two, layer three, layer four through seven services. There are some gotchas when I talk about layer four through seven. And I hopefully, if I have time, we'll come back to it. But otherwise, you had just have to drag me there and ask me the question, why? So and then, if uh, what we do is that we, we, you know, this works on whatever type of hardware you have. That's the idea, because we don't want to force you to choose. The world is different. The vendor of choice needs to be there, like here. And that's what we're providing. So we don't require you to use any type of vendor. This works with whatever type of vendor. We, we may not recommend this to run it on uh, a commercial router, for example. That, that's, that's not what we are saying. But as long as you have a resiliency and an enterprise-grade uh, network infrastructure, you can run it on it. So it's, it's no problem there. But you would gain some benefits, obviously, because we have a lot of... This is a platform, so the idea is to provide the basis that you can do security and uh, things r r turned on quickly in terms of networking and load balancing and all of the features I talked about, but at the same time, preserve what you have been investing in. So I have a slide there, and if there is any question, please come back to that as well. So, wait a minute. So do I have to change my network hardware setup for this? So I, I, I try to uh, give you some of that. But do you remember the, for those of you who were in the beginning of the session, I showed the number there. Is there anybody who remember? Two, OK. So there are two things you need to remember moving out of this room, if I would ask you. That's the two things you would need to run network virtualization is if you run an ESXi platform, so that's, that's basically three. But we're, we're saying since you, nobody raised the hand that there you, you don't see the benefit of uh, server virtualization, I presume that most of you run ESXi. So there is two. So ESXi host, that's one that you have. The two others, basically, that was the number, is the MTU set to handle the VXLAN added 50 byte of packet. So in your entire data center, you need to have, you need to raise the MTU to 1600 on all of your devices. And the second one is that you have to have a, since you are using the infrastructure as a transport layer, the underlay, so to speak, that is resilient, you need to have a, VX, a subnet to carry the VXLAN traffic. So one IP subnet and the MTU. That's what you need. Then you're good to go. So uh, one of the issues here, if you look into automation, what is automation? So we can do automation in networking. We can do sub you know, automation and scripting and all that. But if, if, you, if you change your role in, in the company or somebody else joins and you have an operating system X, you use Juniper, somebody else uses uh, 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 a firewall from Checkpoint, and, and another team uses, for example, load balancer from uh, F5. Those are different operating systems with tied on different certification tracks. And based on your advanced skills that you have in that specific role, you can do automation. That's not what we're talking about here. We are doing, if you're looking into the entire chain, you want to build a service that can be accessible for a, for example, developer in your organization. So you want to provide something internally instead of them going to Amazon Cloud. But if they, can, if they want to do that, you can do that as well, soon, not now. So a extracting, for example, the security features, 
tying that to the infrastructure as a virtual layer, but also extracting that to a cloud. So Azure, uh, uh, AWS, that's something that we're working on that will come. But today, so this builds a net. And today when it works, I talk about this with customers. And many say that, OK, there is a change ticket. What somebody asked for it, there comes in a, a change ticket for uh, the, the switching part or the routing part. And somebody has to do some things manually. And if the pace is higher, then these are done more often, right? And this is maybe not the most interesting thing you want to do to get a change request, put on a uh, VLAN, or as the most problematic thing, put on a rule on the firewall. Put on a rule source that I, I don't know what the source and destination is. I just have to put on a rule on the firewall. And after six months, I have 500 rules and maybe 1,000 of rules. And then what happens next is that somebody say, well, that firewall can't scale. Well, you can run them in clusters. Well, you need to have a multi good uh, software from a vendor that does multi-tenancy so I can see all of these rules. That's the idea how it is today, right? But what we say here is that with a centralized controller, now I, for the first time, I actually see who wants to talk with who. Instead of saying, like now, hey, I want to talk to IP address XYZ. Somebody answer. And then there is a ARP, a ARP reply. OK, I have the one who you want to talk to. And then based on the language, if it's in Farsi or where I have the background, unfortunately, not many people understand, so it's, not, it's useless to talk it. But in, in your case, if it's your local language or if it's OSPF, BGP, ISIS, whatever, then you establish the traffic. But here, what's nice is that for the layer two part and for the firewalling part, you know where the virtual resources are. So that's the idea why you would need a VXLAN IP transport subnet to that's the only requirement, because you know where everything is on the virtual side. So this is the issue, right? Is there some of, can, can you please, you who see this, who has been coming to this type of, can you raise your hand? Anybody seeing some part of this in your organization? Okay. So one at least, that's a comfort, good. <laughs> so when, when we speak of, uh, Automation focus is here on the application. You know what is we what do we want to protect? So we want to say that the database only can talk with the application tier, and the application tier can only talk with the web server. The database cannot talk to the web server, or the web server cannot talk to the other web server. That's the idea, and that's the gain with network virtualization because we can build in firewalling on a VNIC on each virtual machine. I will come to that later. And then obviously, if you, you would have your physical workloads, you can have that still. So if you have an Oracle workload, there are several types of things we can do to take that in. And that's one of the integration with the hardware vendor that we can do to make that easier for you, or scalable, port density, for example. That's one of the things. But ask me if that's a things you want to. And then you want to basically connect them together, so these are each uh, VXLAN uh, subnets, and then tied together with routing and NATed out since it's an application, for example, SharePoint, and somebody wants to access from the outside network. So what, you, what this looks like when we talk, what is automation? This is the idea. So we want to basically, if I uh, shut this down, and then I can, so let me see here. So if I do, sorry for that, it's something happened, just to show you what I'm talking about. <laughs> so what you see here is that there is a requirement for somebody to actually uh, provision a network, right? A, a profile that is tied to network. So this is what I'm doing. I, I have a three-tier app, app that I want to request for as a developer. And there is a portal that I have access, role-based access to, that I can request for. And then I request for that. And then I can choose, basically, what amount of 
web VMs, database VMs, app VMs I want for my specific environment. So infrastructure as a service. This is basically infrastructure as a service. What's important here is that we are what we did as well, if you saw at the beginning there was a network profile tied to the uh, three-tier app model, there is a, all the networking pieces are done virtually here. So you're not talking to any uh, device, physical device, to achieve layer two, layer three, firewalling load balancing. It's only purely done in software. So this means that if you want to set up something for somebody, an application that works, that needs to communicate to the outside world or internally, if you want to use load balancing to test the features of that uh, application, whatever, you can do it quite quickly. So we have customers that do this with point-to-point -point integration on hardware, taking them, for example, uh, several months to do it. But now with this tool, it comes down to, down to minutes to actually request and have things up and running. And what's nice about this, that is very hard in the traditional world, is that when you're decommissioning, so if, you're, if you have a cost tied to the, the time I want to have these resources, when that time is uh, over, then everything is released. All of the rules are moved away. So nobody has to do the change requests, right? Change requests coming in, move that thing away. But you never do that. You're Today, you're only adding things up. And that's the complexity when you are looking in around, having 200 applications in your environment. How do you do that? When, when the idea, unfortunately, in the traditional was just add things up. So that's one of the things we can handle with automation. So more concretely, if I look into uh, what we're talking about in terms of rules, we use uh, local switching, routing, firewall, load balancing. That is the profile that I, that I showed previously. You have security groups. Some of the things that you want to add as a group is based on DNS and AD. They want to be accessible everywhere, so you build a simple rule that is accessible for everybody. And then in the tool, you have a policy that you would tie to uh, these can be accessible or for the web piece, for example, that allow inbound HTTPS, allow outbound any. Or add a third-party integration with IPS only for these resources. Today, if you are doing this, it's very hard to pick some workloads to send to an IPS. You basically use everything in the DMZ, all the IP addresses or a range or whatever. But here you can choose and pick some of the things you want to do. And those are released once things are not needed anymore. So then the idea for the, applic uh, for the application server. So I this is a zero trust model. It's not about deny, 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 deny. You only allow the traffic that is allowed for that part of the SharePoint server that needs to talk to the destination, and then you restrict, deny everything else. So then the question is, okay, if I'm an admin, I want to access SH SSH and do fancy stuff. What can I do? Well, if you have AD, Active Directory, you can base the groups so the groups can be a part of the tree of the Active Directory. So if you are an admin tied in, then you would do enable to use SSH. So you are reducing the attack vector. That's the idea. And what's nice about this as well is that there is a one REST API that you need to access for all of the things I talked about from the uh, cloud management portal that I showed to the NSX is a REST API. So you don't need to use our uh, cloud management tool if you want. As long as your tool handles the REST API, you can use any uh, OpenStack, for example, or any other uh, your own customized. And with you get the idea. You would build your own network based on your construct that you feel flat networks or layered networks that, that I described earlier based on a specific subnet represented by each layer of an application in the tier. So we, talk about, uh, we talked about the underlay, the construct, the architecture of NSX components. What we add is basically all these features 
logical switching, uh, so distributed logical switching, distributed routing, firewalling, which is distributed also in the ESXi host. So we are doing things in the ESXi host. And then we have some functions. So these are east-west, so from database to the application server, application to the web. But virtual machines for a, a multi-tenant environment, or if you want to build a tenant based on your choice, you have the north-south traffic that is done by this. So we, have, we can do firewalling here as well, if you want. And this is a use case, for example, large organization, or it can be for smaller as well, but that's where I see it. And then you can do physical to virtual. So there are some functions you would do in a virtual machine. And this sits in a specific rack to handle resiliency based on the uh, traditional you know, functions we have had, HA functions in, uh, uh, net in VMware, like DRS and so on. And then you have the controllers. These also will sit in your management rack. You would have three of those. Everything is replicated everywhere. These are the brain of the system. So they know about all of the IP tables, the VTEP, VXLAN tunnel endpoints. They know about uh, all of the, uh, ma 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 the, all the MAC tables and so on. So they know wh where things are sitting. And then you would have the NSX manager, which is also another piece where you have the REST API integration through the, to the ma cloud management platform or to the third parties. So these are the things that is the construct of NSX. That is our product, and that does network virtualization. So what's the power of distribution? As you, as you remember from this slide, I said that some of the things can be done locally, right? And we will soon be able to do load balancing as well in the ESXi host. That means that if you compare it to today, right, here is a, a description of Nexus 7000 Cisco uh, core uh, distribution aggregation layer routers tied to UCS fabric interconnects, that is the switches that ties the UCS blade to the above layer. And then here you have the here you, you would have one VM that would talk to another VM. Both of them are residing on the same blade server. So the issue is that you have to trombone the traffic to your routers if you want to route the traffic. But with network virtualization, as long as you have the subnet and I talked about, you ne the traffic never leaves the host. So the physical server, this is a distributed system, you handle the routing locally. And by the way, there is no ARP requests. Because the ARP requests are suppressed by the controller. So you don't flood the, the, the uh, network with ARP requests. There are some gotchas with that, but that's the idea. And that works for as long as the source and decision is within the realm of VM to VM. And if you look into uh, for example, from uh, uh, VM on a, another blade talking to VM on another blade, still you would take fewer hops versus more hops on a traditional setup without NSX. So that's the idea. You're reducing the traffic. You're making things more smarter. And the problem is that why we see this as important, because most of the traffic in the data center, because of network virtualization consolidation, contains more applications. This means that there is more traffic. So if you communicate from outside to web server, that's only 10 to 20% of your entire traffic. But the majority is from web server to application server, application to database, database to application, to application server to web server. And that's a three-tier. If you have multi-tier model, that's even more. And this is a way of handling that locally instead of building out. We go from 10 gig to 40 gig to 80 gig to 100 gig based on the hardware. And the firewalling is the same thing. Now you trombone the traffic to the firewall, but with this, you're doing things locally. So every virtual machine has a distributed firewall, a stateful firewall, layer two to layer four, that we can handle. Packet inspection, we need a, if you want to do that, you need a 
uh, third party like Palo Alto, Checkpoint, or Fortinet now. That's the idea. That is the, in emanu uh, the automatic integration we do with them. So, <coughs> with that said, we have the servers. Here you would see them. We have the network, as you see at the last slide. Uh, here is a network construct. The software is basically in the hypervisors, so the hosts that I mentioned. And NSX uses a distribute, uh, distributed virtual switch to build the isolated, uh, unique VXLANs. And once that, once that is done, you can build the network how you want. What's also important is if you want to use, for example, fi distributed firewalling that I talked about, you don't require, it doesn't require us to actually use VXLAN. So you can run a distributed firewall and have firewalling rules on, on each and every uh, VM without turning on VXLAN. But with VXLAN, you get some smarter stuff. So you can base the source on a VXLAN network. So that's one of the ideas, and that makes it easier for you. Load balancing doesn't require us to use VXLAN as well. So those are the things you can do without even turning on VXLAN. So the, the benefit of this is that if you do a vMotion and you have all the policies tied to a VM, the policies follows with the VM. So you don't need, if you would want to do a vMotion from one data center to another, there are some constraints based on if you want to stretch the cluster, the, the storage cluster, and so on, or if you don't have that. But the idea is that you don't require on the hardware side what's needed. If you want to have a, spe you, you don't need to run a specific DCI interconnect from a specific vendor to have this, make this happen. Uh, yeah, and here we basically through the cloud management portal access an SX controller and through the REST API build the networks in the hypervisors and with VXLAN. I won't have time to go through this. If, if this is important for you, come by and we can explain. So VXLAN is all about encapsulation from source hypervisor to destination hypervisor. If it's a physical workload, then it's to a physical host, physical server, that then translates from there to from a VXLAN to VLAN. Or if you would want to have a switch and a hardware vendor integration, then you would do the translation in uh, some, um, some uh, uh, hardware VTEP devices from a vendor like Arista, Dell, Cumulus, uh, HP that is coming up now, and, and Juniper as well. So those capabilities will be there, are actually in there, but for proof of concept, but it will come after the new year in, in the release. So you would build your logical networks. And what's nice is that each here, you would see that each network segment, uh, V switch that you would build, the virtual switch layer, is separated with different uh, address range, right? But those can actually be residing, having same IP address range. Because you don't see, you don't look at the, in the back, in the previous world of VLAN, you would look into the VLAN and those need to be separated. And if you want to talk between them, you need to route between them. And you can't have overlapping, v, uh, overlapping IP address range. That's quite hard to handle. But in here, you can actually have that. It's not shown here specifically, but you can have that. And that's one of the uses I see some of the customers use when they want to connect a subnet being uh, having some workloads in a smaller data center, but still be reachable through the same subnet. So then you can do this, actually. And as I said, there is no require for specific VLANs than the ones I talked about, the IP transport subnet VLAN that you would need. You won't need any access list. You won't need any specific firewall rules. It works. With your current on your current infrastructure, uh, and for the virtual workloads, we either use the so let me see, we either use the layer two gateway, which is x86 appliance, or a top of rack switch from a specific vendor where to to connect the physical workload. So there are two choices: either use a x86 server to handle the physical to virtual 
and you translate the VXLAN to VLANs or the VLANs to VXLANs, or you would use a hardware VTEP integration with a vendor that does this. And the ones I spoke of was the ones I spoke of earlier, so yeah. So about visibility, just giving you some, this is a broad topic, but I want to, these are the questions I usually get, so I want to just show you that this is a myth that you don't have visibility. You even have more visibility. Because when you are looking into this list, you see that you can do uh, flow monitoring capabilities that is quite nice on a VNIC level. So you can take out the flow and see active flows, and you can do TCP dumps, you can do Wireshark plugin for VXLAN here, you can do port mirroring. Uh, that is uh, a feature like R span, ER span from the virtual machines itself, but physically it's from the server. And you can do, you know, sw simple things like SNMP, uh, MIBs that, that we support, and also you have a central CLI, so you can go in and uh, in the controller and you can see uh, all the rules, all the associated VTEPs hardware, and you can see what hosts have those specific rules, and you can even look into specific x86 hosts and see what are my rules within that realm as well and all the associated MAC addresses and so on. And there's a whole bunch of uh, things you can do that is quite uh, advanced if there is some interest in that. So micro-segmentation. We talk about just a question, how long time do we have? Any Ten, Ten minutes, okay, great. So when we say micro-segmentation, it's basically the security. And one of the first things I talked about was uh, reducing risk, if you remember. And I've mentioned some of the basic ideas around distributed firewalling, you know, we do things on a virtual machine and so on. But the thing is that we, we can actually do that today. So on a technical level, you can put a lot of firewalls in, inside a data center today to achieve segmentation. And some of the customers, for example, I work with a little bit uh, different type of customers and the service providers or the public sector some there already does that but it, the, the problem it has is that you need to know where the source and destination is and then you, you, you need to stitch that based on the protection in a box that you want to handle that protection so you need to go into a virtual edition firewall do the source destination there then you need to go to another one and do the source destination and then another one another one but the idea here is that when a, it's, it's not possible to do, it's hard to handle this. So we think that the reason why we see attacks when something come in and move around from server to server and set a back channel to outside network, you can't get help with the CM tool. You see where the, what the attack vector look like, what it done, but you are always a step behind, right? And one of the things we think that we can do here, I will come to that, is that by doing zero trust through a distributed system with a central GUI, you can do a, you're reducing amount of rules, but you have more granularity in the rules, and with that, you can't, you're not allowing this lateral movement. So that's the idea we have. We think that with NSX, you would do micro segmentation and you don't require VLANs, you don't require access lists, so private VLANs. If you want to, today, if you want to uh, restrict the traffic between two web servers, you have to do a p private VLAN, and you have to go to in that specific switch, right? And it's hard to do that if you have 10 applications. So those of you who have used v private VLAN know that it's a mess. So what it happens is that you do for 50%, and then the rest you, you don't do. And something, when it comes in, So that's the idea. And o o of course, one other thing is that we base everything on IP address. That's old stuff, right? It has been done for 20 years, and we don't think that's the... If the world is moving, if VMs are moving, you need to use other constructs. Specifically, if you have several tiers of the uh, applications. So this I talked about. And I don't have time to go through this, but the idea is that you can do, th that was the part I said, that you can actually do this with physical firewalls and virtual firewalls, but there is an operational add, header added always. 
Yes, and this was about uh, distribution and the power of distribution. So what we can do is that we move away from this model basically to a perimeter inside uh, data center security model that is no longer tied to VLANs and security constructs that you use in hardware. So you're basically choosing the hypervisor as an enforcement point. And with that, since we are vCenter, right, VMworld, ESXi host, what we can do is that we can use actually the, the, the construct of vCenter objects. V, uh, virtual machine names, or vNix, or uh, different hosts, or VXLAN switches, or v v virtual routers, or a specific load balance, a traffic coming from a uh, set of hosts that you would search up based on specific criteria. So that's something you can build to use grouping. So grouping is done uh, uh, dynamically, basically. And this means that if you are moving, so policies and farts on the hypervisor, as I talked about, if you move a VM, the policy comes with it. If you take away the VM, the policy goes away with it. You don't have to do the manual configuration for the rules to be part of that life cycle. One other thing that is important, once we are doing things in the host, gives us the ability to understand best from the worst, both worlds. Because for, you of you, for those of you who have wor worked with the ASXI environment and knows that we can look into the files, right, in the different VM operating systems. And that's one vCenter object. You can base rules, distribute firewall rules, say, I don't want to allow traffic between web servers, uh, sorry, Windows machines, or between Windows machine and a Linux machine. So that, that's something we can do. But what you can do is that you can, since you're seeing what's happening in the file, you can say that, okay, once I see PCI compliant data, then I need to do IPS from traffic steering the traffic to the virtual uh, machine from Palo Alto, for example, or Checkpoint or Fortinet. Instead of right, like today, you steer everything to your IPS and then, okay, dear customer, you now have to move from 2 gig to 4 gig to 16 gig based on appliance you have and so on. So more granularity. And this gives you better visibility because you know what you are sending to the IPS. You are doing fewer false positives. You are reducing the, the you know, things, that the, the domain specifically, fault uh, isolation. And auditing is easier as well. Together with the one I talked about that, you know, the firewall rules moves away, so you know what's actually current. And what we will be able to do is to build service chain. So based on some criteria, we move the traffic to a, to a next generation firewall. Based on the outcome of that, we tag the traffic and move it to another thing. Or what we will be enabled to do, uh, n not right now, but what we'll be capable of, is to encrypt the traffic based on something. So we can do service chains. And one of the integration just to mention that we have with firewall vendors is that if they would, if you, for example, use a checkpoint, say, file, if you use one of the blades as a column, the anti-botnet, based on the, if you would see that all the red flags are going on, they can set a tag on a VM through the REST API integration we have. And that, if you have defined that tag, in a specific isolated group, we move that VM to an isolated group and instantly that specific infected device cannot talk to anybody else. Or you would want to do monitoring, for example, based on something that is triggered by the tagging. So a little bit about security I talked about. I believe that this is a quite impressive uh, ecosystem that we have. Some of them we don't have r already, but we have announced that we will work with them. But we have currently Palo Alto integration, Trend Micro, Intel, Symantec, Rapid7, which has really nice into with the Metasploit acquisition that they made. They can do you know, penetration-based uh, reports and put scores on a VM. And based on a score, once it had reached a threshold, we can isolate, for example, automatically. Exedium, they can do some, or High Trust, they can do some nice things around logging of users and so on, very granular. They can even record a user if they are doing something. Checkpoint we have already, and also Tufin we have already, for those of you. And in, in terms of 
uh, load balancer, we can use the internal load balancing features, but we can also integrate with uh, these guys. Monitoring, you have the capabilities here from these vendors that we can integrate to to see the VXLAM, for example. Many of, you know, it's a standard, so you can actually do that. And also, the hardware VTAP integration that I talked about, where the actual physical switch participates in the controller infrastructure, this is done in, in, in these vendors. This is, will come out. It's actually in the software today, 6.2.1, but it's for proof of concept purpose. But after New Year, it will come out as a general availability. But you can still run it on your uh, Cisco switch or so, so it, it, we have actually a design guide for a classical entire Cisco switch family, if you want to see that, how things are set in the UCS port profiles. Basically, the picture I showed from Nexus 7000 UCS, you have it in a specific design guide. And if you want to move to a leaf spine fabric with Nexus 9000, a benefit is that you would actually use the same methodology in terms of operational model here in this world as well, because it's quite similar how you uh, operate this world and you're using NXOS. So the benefit, this is the last slide, the benefit of this is also that you can, it's software, right? So you can test everything that I talked about, all things about uh, NSX and also the uh, cloud management platform that is vRealize Automation through hosted evaluation, something we call VMware hosted evaluation. You have also something called, uh, that's basically you, you require to register a user and then you can trigger a, I think it takes two minutes to set up the environment and then you're ready to go. And then you have a PDF you can run through and lab yourself through all of the features. And that's the latest test software always. So it's updated now, it's 6.2.1. So you can use the trace flow capabilities and all the new stuff here as well. Um, that I didn't have time to go through, but you can test this, and if there is any, uh, you don't know how to do it, we can send you the link, just come by our stand. And there is a prize to win as well. So if you can say, the first one who would say, what is the two requirements we have, will win the prize. So what is the two requirements for that? Submit them 6900. Great. So we have a winner. <laughs> so thank you for that. So you are welcome to co collect the prize. And thanks for your time and listening to me. Hopefully I gave you a brief overview of what we are doing in this world. Thank you. <laughs>